That's our proclamation. That's our declaration. Wherever we are, let's declare it together that we choose to worship right here and right now. When the enemy says I'm done, I lift my praises. When my world comes crashing down, I lift my praises. I, till the darkness turns to dawn, I lift my praises. I choose to worship. I choose to Good morning and welcome to St Mary's. Uh, it's so good to have you uh, in this season of Advent and it's lovely that you've joined us online for this service. If this is your first time with us, an especially warm welcome to you. And if you're a regular, uh, we're delighted that you're here with us again. Now, this morning is the penultimate talk in our teaching series of Faith That Works. And we've been looking at what the Bible has to say about how faith in God works when the world doesn't. And this week, how faith works to enable us to manage money and wealth wisely. Uh, this, I find, is a topic that is of interest to most people. So as we usually do, uh, we're going to begin with some worship. And my prayer throughout it all is that in our time together, uh, we're going to discover more of who God really is and that we're going to find encouragement in whatever situation, whatever circumstances we find ourselves in. So shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a great God. Father, we thank you that you are in charge of heaven and earth. And Lord God, we come before you this morning and we simply want to hear and to experience and to know more of who you really are. And so I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, yeah. 
One of the things COVID-19 has so ruthlessly exposed is how unfairly it treats different segments of society. Now, here in the UK, we're seeing that the poorest areas in our country have been the hardest hit. So here's a recent headline. UK's poorest areas facing COVID-19 double whammy of illness and poverty. The pandemic is simply shining a brighter light on an issue that was already there. And the topic of money and wealth is one that exercises so many people. It's no wonder then that the Bible offers much wisdom about how to use money and wealth wisely. In fact, money was one of the subjects that Jesus spoke about most frequently. The Bible talks regularly about where true riches and contentment can be found, and it's not in accumulating wealth. I wonder then if this is one of the reasons why Jesus' radical teaching and offer of abundant life often falls on closed ears on many people in the West. Because in the West there are these twin philosophies of consumerism, of kind of spending, and of hedonism, of pleasure seeking, that are so rampant. It's a tragedy that many people become trapped in these ungodly systems through needing more and more and of trying to find meaning and pleasure through consumption. It's surely little surprise then that in the UK gambling addiction rates are now much higher than previously thought. So it's to this topic of managing money and wealth that James turns to. Now last week I mentioned that I've had the privilege of travelling quite extensively in the world, most often in places experiencing a significant deprivation and poverty. And in no way am I wanting to ignore or minimise the very reals of, of, of poverty that we see in the UK. But I think perspective can be helpful. And it always shocks me when I read statistics such as, if your annual income is around the UK average, which is said to be about 30,000, it means that in terms of the global population, you're in the top 2% of richest, richest people. Or take another one. Global extreme poverty is defined as living on less than about £1.40 a day and about 10% of the world's population, that's almost 700 million people, live like this. Now, perspective doesn't mean that the problems closer to home evaporate, but it can help us adopt a different approach and attitude to our life and how we treat others. So this morning, in our penultimate talk in our series A Faith That Works, which is based on James's short letter in the New Testament, we're going to look at managing money and wealth wisely. So let's continue reading from James chapter 5, verses 1 through to 6. It reads this. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you fail to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Wow, that's more hard-hitting teaching from James, and we should be familiar with it by now. Now, in these opening verses of chapter 5, James blasts against the rich, highlighting their greed and corruption in terms of how they're unfairly treating those under their care, and the consequences that they're going to face because of their self-indulgence and neglect of those less fortunate than themselves. This is strong stuff, and although James clearly had in mind the rich oppressors of his day, it's difficult not to read it without being personally challenged and to reflect on our own attitudes and motives towards wealth and how we use it. For even if we don't consider ourselves rich in comparison with those around us, it's hard to avoid the blunt facts that in contrast to the vast majority of the world's population, we are all rich. So how can we learn from this? Again, uh, like last week's talk, I want to offer four principles from the Bible for how to manage money and wealth wisely. There's going to be three don'ts and one do. So here goes. The first point. Don't selfishly hoard wealth. 
or let's put it slightly differently, you could say, when it comes to money, don't hoard it foolishly. Now we see this in verse three, you have hoarded wealth in the last days. Now hoarding clearly means to accumulate, that is to build up money or possessions and to hide it or, or to store it away. And as we clearly see from the passage that selfish hoarding is foolish, not least because your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Now let's not misunderstand what's going on here. It's not that God opposes wealth, it's that he opposes greed. There are many passages in the Bible that talk about God's blessing through wealth, especially we read these in the Old Testament. So for example, Proverbs 10 verse 22 in the ESV translation, it says, the blessing of the Lord makes rich and he adds no sorrow with it. It's what you do with it. Money in the right hands is a tool to be used in the service of others and to bless others. In contrast, in wrong hands, in the hands of the foolish, it can lead to all sorts of problems and become a burden rather than a blessing. Now, one of the most often misquoted verses in the Bible concerns money and is falsely taken to say that money is a root of all kinds of evil. In fact, the verse in mind in 1 Timothy 6 verse 10 actually reads, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. The problem is not money itself, it's the love of money. Now with a little familiarity with some of Jesus' teaching, it's not difficult to see James having here in mind Jesus' teaching of the parable of the rich fool. We mentioned this last week. In it, Jesus rebukes the rich farmer for hoarding his wealth to spend on his own selfish pleasures, only to suddenly die and leave behind all that was his to someone else. Luke 12 verses 18 to 20 reads this. Then he said, this is what the farmer said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? A better approach surely is not to hoard wealth, but to save it wisely and to spend it in helping others. These opening verses from James then carry strong warnings about the foolishness of selfishly hoarding wealth. And there are clear warnings that for those who do in this passage will face judgment. We read about weeping and wailing and misery. That's why society's subtle and pervasive narrative today to accumulate and to spend on ourselves is so insidious and dangerous because it erodes away at the freedom that God wants for us in our life. And many choose instead to be trapped by the lure and the lifestyle suggested by selfish accumulation that we, we see and hear so much around us today. I wonder if that's why Jesus in another of his well-known parables about a camel, a needle and the kingdom of God said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. You might want to look that up in Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through to 27. Second point, don't accumulate money dishonestly. Now in verse four we read, look, the wages you fail to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. This simply reflects what we see time and again in the Bible about the call to act honestly and to show justice and mercy to others. The counter to accumulating money and wealth dishonestly. And, and here in our passage is also the assumption that in doing so, others are being treated poorly. The counter then to this is to treat others fairly. For example, we might take a look at one of the Proverbs. Now, Proverbs 10, verse two, uh, reading from the Good News translation says this, wealth you get by dishonesty will do you no good, but honesty can save your life. 
Or if we were to say, look at the prophet Micah about how we are to treat others, Micah 6 verse 8. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Again, clear, straightforward teaching to reflect on. Don't accumulate money dishonestly and treat others fairly. Thirdly, from the passage, don't waste money on self-indulgent living. You get that in 5 verse 5. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. James clearly has in mind here the contrast between the suffering of the poor that he's already referred to and to the luxury and the self-indulgence of the rich. He's thinking about those who live thinking only of yourself and your luxuries, indulging every whim and pleasure you have. Though written to address people in a situation in the first century, these words are surely as relevant today as they were then. Are we not only too familiar with seeing situations around the world uh, where uh, we see people living in great and vulgar disparities between rich and poor? Now, we see that not only in far-off nation, nations where a rich elite might oppress the poor majority, but do we not also see such things nearer to home? Again, the writer of the Proverbs gets it spot on. It is captured particularly well in the message translation of Proverbs 13 verse 7 that reads, A pretentious, showy life is an empty life. A plain and simple life is a full life. And the obvious response to wasting money on self-indulgent living is to share wealth generously. So standing in sharp contrast to the wisdom of this world, the Bible says, and, and again we see uh, this following principle in the book of Proverbs 11 verses 24 to 25. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper, Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Again, pretty clear and straightforward teaching. It's much harder and takes courage, though, to live by it. Fourthly, and really building on this last point, and to end on a positive, is this. Do use money to help others. In verse 6 of James' reading, we see some unsavoury stuff. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Although it's not entirely clear who or what James has in mind here, I think we can be pretty confident that on the whole James is wanting to remind us that so often in life it is the righteous or, or the good people who are helpless victims of the plans and actions of the rich and the powerful. And again, throughout scripture, we can find time and again encouragements to use money for the good of others to help and serve them. So let's just end then with two passages from the Bible to emphasise this point. The first is from 2 Corinthians 8 verse 14, and it's a reminder that when we have been blessed with plenty, and when we recognise that there are needs in those around us, it is good to share with them and to meet their needs. So that, well, let's, let's read. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. And finally, again from the New Testament, the words of the Apostle Paul provide a fitting end to this topic and a reminder of where true life can be found. So I'm going to close by reading from 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, verses 17 through to 19. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Shall we pray? 
Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to, to spend time looking at the Bible. And Father, we thank you for the letter that James uh, wrote. Father, for its hard-hitting truths. And we pray that they cut through and reveal just the kind of the, the falseness and, and, and the foolishness of wanting to go after money and wealth in this world. Lord God, I pray that we might each soberly reflect on the teaching that we've heard this morning and so that we might respond in a manner that brings glory and honour to your name. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, I lit the first of the candles in our Advent wreath and spoke about some of the heroes of the opening chapters of the Old Testament and their part in the greatest story ever to be told, the birth of Jesus our Saviour. The second candle is lit to celebrate the lives of the prophets. The prophets were men inspired by the Holy Spirit to speak for God and to guide the people of Israel along the path that God had set before them and to prepare them spiritually to welcome God's Messiah. Prophecy, however, is not only about foretelling, but forthtelling, speaking out when the people started to stray from God's path and defiling the holy nation into which God's Son was to be born. Forthtelling is not always a welcome attribute, and many of the prophets were ill-treated, or worse, for telling the truth. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, light of the world, the prophet said that you would bring peace and save your people in trouble. Give peace in our hearts at Christmas tide and show all the world God's love. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed your time this morning and look forward to being able to welcome you back to another one of our services. If you would like to find out more about what takes place at St Mary's, please do join us for uh, other online services or if you're in the area uh, and they're now running again, please uh, do come along to one of our in-person services. And why not take a moment to fill out one of our Get Connected cards if you haven't done so already. Now we've heard some really challenging things this morning, so if you'd like to explore more about the claims of the Christian faith, Alpha is a great place to do that. Now if you'd like to join the next course or you have any questions about it, why not just get in contact and email alpha at stmarysperley.org.uk. Uh, something else you might be interested in is being able to meet with other Christians uh, or with others in a small group and growing in your faith. Now we offer things called connect groups and they are a great place for doing this. So again, do get in contact with us if you're interested in joining one of those. As we so often do, following on from this service, there's gonna be a gathering on Zoom to connect and meet with others and to reflect on our topic. So once the service is finished, why don't you make yourself a coffee and then join with others online and the connection details will be displayed at the end of the service. But now, let me close with a blessing for Advent. Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you, scatter the darkness from before your path, and make you ready to meet him when he comes in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>